my name is Pastor Eric Schaefer. I'm the senior pastor here at Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Santa Monica, California, and this is Hope Matters. Each week, I talk to an interesting guest from around the community and even around the nation and around the world about the theme of hope because we believe that hope matters. My guest today is a many-year friend of mine, the Reverend Robert Chase, the United Church of Christ pastor, the founding director of Intersections International in New York City, and there are many other items in his pedigree that some of, the things, some of which we'll get to today. So welcome, Bob. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Eric. And before we begin, I just want to uh, give you kudos for doing this series. You know, uh, we always need hope. Uh, it's the emotional fuel that propels us forward, but now maybe more than ever, hope is important. And so uh, this is a great service you're providing and it's an honor to participate. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you very much. As, as you've seen, you've talked to a lot of people and you know, and the wonderful thing about YouTube is, of course, they all live for, forever in one sense. And so we have, I have people looking at ones from a year ago, you know, and, and still so, uh, and many of them are pretty evergreen in the sense of, as you say, the theme of hope, that's kind of consistent in our lives. Uh, we probably have greater need right now for it, but, you know, we always have need for it. <laughs> yeah, we always do have need for hope, but I think this this amazing time that we're in with these, uh, this confluence of crises that we're facing, you know, the pandemic, of course, and then there's the racial reckoning that have, has emerged out of uh, some of the conflict in the, in the uh, summer and uh, the crisis that, uh, of, of, uh, that's brought on because parents are now having to be educators as well as the uh, panoply of other responsibilities they have. So hope is really essential. And I think that this is a, you know, well-timed for the particular time we're in. So Bob, you were the founding director of an organization called Intersections International in New York City, where you served until your retirement just a few years ago. So I think our viewers would be interested in knowing a little bit about Intersections International. Great, thank you. Um, yes, Intersections is, a permanent initiative of the Collegiate Church of New York, which is the oldest corporation in North America, dating back to 1628. Um, Intersections is now just over 10 years old. Uh, and I served as a founding director, as you said, for the first decade of its existence. Uh, Intersections purpose, its underlying purpose is to bring people together across lines of difference. And so there are many uh, differences in our divided universe today. And so it became uh, important for us to kind of narrow the focus and choose particular areas where we wanted to address uh, crises that were happening at that time. So um, we selected four areas and did our work in, in primarily in those areas. The first was healing the rift between the Muslim and non-Muslim worlds. Uh, and the second was in um, addressing the divide between the military and the civilian population in this country. The third was in terms of the LGBTQ community and its relationship to the religious community. And then finally, we did work uh, using the arts as an instrument of uh, social change. So. Those, um, uh, th th that series of uh, portfolios led us to work both locally in the New York City area where Intersections was located, and then uh, uh, globally into Central Asia, the Middle East, and other places as well. That I do remember, and I remember through your various programs, all of those emphases, and of course you and I got involved in a lot of other things over the years, but um, so, I think when I think of intersections and you, I do think of what I think was your signature program, the work in interfaith dialogue in, in Pakistan between Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And so, um, you know, and the multiple times you traveled there and the conferences. So I think our viewers would be interested to know, and especially since as, as we've talked before, um, there are a lot of things that people don't know about Pakistan and, inter and interfaith relations on the ground there. Yes. Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Eric. Yes, we, um, about a decade ago, we established a program called the U.S.-Pakistan Interreligious Coalition. 
And what we did was annually, we would send a group of uh, religious leaders, community organizers, scholars and students who were uh, from a variety of faith perspectives to Pakistan, where of course the predominant uh, religious perspective there is Muslim. And we would engage in dialogue around um, human rights and human need and how we could work together both across our uh, national borders, but also uh, in an interfaith way so that we could uh, address those critical uh, issues both there and here in the US. It was um, an incredible program that, uh, that um, started very small, but grew to the point where we had literally hundreds of people participating uh, in our sessions. And one of the surprising things for me uh, was the um, degree of interest that uh, Pakistanis, uh, especially young Pakistanis, had about the United States. And so we were engaged with the student population there, especially Pakistani women, female students, who were um, uh, not at all like the stereotypes that we would be led to believe about being sub, uh, subservient and um, uh, and uh, you know sheltered and that kind of thing, very assertive, very aggressive, very curious about what life was like in the U.S. And we had some incredibly engaging conversations uh, with those students. I remember you said that. Both sides, if we're going to call them sides in this dialogue, had perceptions about the other that were really off kilter, that were not right. And, and you had a great time of kind of, you know, talking about what the U.S. was really and they're telling you what Pakistan was really and things like that. That's true, Eric. Uh, you and I first met when we were both uh, communications directors in our uh, respective denominations. So we know a little bit about communications and about the role the media can play in presenting a reality. And we discovered quite quickly that our understanding as presented by the media of Pakistanis was very different than what we really discovered there. And by the same token, their understanding of uh, Americans was very different. We were perceived, all of us, as the uh, kind of, let's say, George Bush style Christian cowboys, you know, and um, that wasn't true at all. And so one of our first tasks and one of the important uh, things in terms of list, in terms of communication is listening to the other. So it was important to begin by asking them to tell us their story, their understanding of uh, uh, the US and that led to some very deep and trusting conversation. Empathy and trust are key elements, whether you are communicating within a congregation or whether you are communicating across national borders. And that's, um, uh, that's something that we were able to, uh, to uh, kindle in, in that uh, relationship with our uh, Pakistani counterparts. And you've been able to carry that dialogue into your uh, retirement work life a bit as you moved it to, uh, was it Seton Hall University? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Um, I'm, uh, once I left intersections and the decision was made by my successor not to continue that work as in that format, um, uh, Seton Hall, I became a fellow at Seton Hall University and my responsibilities there was to continue um, that work uh, under the auspices of Seton Hall. We were able to do that uh, and were prepared to go back to Pakistan when of course the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis pandemic hit and we were unable to travel. So what we did was um, using digital technology and you know the kind of thing that allows us to have this conversation here, which is a whole change from when you and I first met, um, and we had a uh, global uh, conference, um, the virtual conference, where we had um, 1,900 registrants from 32 countries that gathered together for over a period of three days where we had um, about 50 presenters from six countries. And there was streaming of that entire conference in Pakistan 
to an audience of about 330,000. So it was very successful, but indicative of the, um, uh, of the, the need uh, for this communication, even though right now, Pakistan, of course, is not in the headlines. And one of the lessons from this decade long interaction was to stay the course, whether the headlines were, were inflamed because of a, an incident between uh, Pakistan and the US or whether they were quiet. By staying the course, you build the relationship of trust, which enables you when there is an incident to, uh, to continue the dialogue. So listening and staying the course, that sounds like good advice in almost any relationship, doesn't it, Bob? Yes, it does. Um, and um, sorry about that. So it, uh, uh, yes, it does. Staying the course uh, and building trust. And I would say the two things when we're thinking about communications um, that is really critical are those, uh, those elements of both trust and empathy. And of course, that grows out of the ability to listen. Uh, communication is not just speaking. Uh, it is also listening. And that's uh, really important. And I think one of the things to come back to those crises that are confronting our society now that I'm so encouraged about, because there are elements of hope, even in the midst of these dark times. And I know you know that. But with the, for example, with the um, the racial reckoning that we've been experiencing uh, these past uh, several months and actually parts of our uh, society have been experiencing for uh, generations or even centuries is this new ability on the part of basically white people to listen to and un better understand and empathize with the plight of our, uh, with people of color and what they've had to endure throughout the year. And this is uh, throughout the years. And this has become a really, um, a really significant uh, sign of hope for me as we move forward in terms of uh, uh, the American mosaic, this wonderful society that we have. Well, and you've already gotten, you've already come around to our theme of hope, which, which is always what I hope to get to at least near the end of the interview. And uh, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, um, I'm, you know, you and I are both very hopeful for the new administration and in Washington and the efforts it's making and for a president who has, who exudes empathy <laughs> and kindness. You know, what a, what a change uh, and, you know, that's something to be very grateful for. And now a pandemic that looks like what, knock on wood, that we're getting it under control. Um, and, you know, those are, it is a hopeful time again in America, you know, and uh, with, with all the challenges before us. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Eric. And despite all the, uh, the um, pain and suffering that this pandemic has brought, I think that there are these wonderful glimmers of hope, whether it be the frontline workers who relentlessly sacrifice themselves and, you know, in terms of uh, taking the risk in a very uncertain time, especially last spring here in the Northeast. It was yeah. nobody knew what we were dealing with. And yet you saw these frontline healthcare workers and others who were, uh, you know, uh, just waging the, uh, the battle against this un unknown uh, enemy in, in wonderfully compassionate terms. And that's, that's really been great. You know, I think um, the, the thing that's really kind of um, hopeful for me right now is that as we come out of this pandemic, that those glimmers and those examples and even conversations like we're having now are, uh, are the, um, the foundation for a new way of relating to one another so that even uh, in the midst of this crisis, uh, there will be seeds planted that will enable us to um, you know, love one another more completely and be uh, empathetic and sympathetic to one another as we move forward. So it is a time and, and again, uh, this uh, series that you're creating is an important element in, uh, in helping that to happen. Thank you.
Well, thank you for being with us today, Bob. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's great to talk to you anytime and uh, to talk about our common backgrounds and uh, you know concerns. Uh, you're a retired guy, but you're very busy, which is, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're my, you're my model. So I <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Thanks so much for having me, Eric. Such a good time. It's always good to see you, Bob, and thank you for being with us. This has been Hope Matters, a weekly program presented by Mount Olive Lutheran Church, in which we talk to interesting people about the theme of hope, because we believe that hope matters. We believe we have a God of hope. Thanks to the Reverend Bob Chase, Robert Chase, who's with us this week, and we hope to see you again next week. This is Hope Matters. See you next time.